Now, what a great pleasure it is to see and, of course, hear a man who we haven't had anything from in the past two years, because like most performers, we've had nothing from them either. Mm -hmm. Hi, Milton Jones. How are you doing? Nice to see you. You as well. Now, I must say that you're looking very fresh. You're looking ready. You must be going out soon to perform something. You must be. Yes. Well, when lockdown happened, I was halfway through a tour. And uh, so basically, I've got to finish that tour. But the trouble is, uh, everyone's got to finish a lot of things. And theatre dates are spread out all over the place. And in this sort of in-between stage, we try to do as much work as possible. So over the summer, I was doing festivals and things. And now I'm going actually out on tour, uh, doing different dates. So um, hopefully, we don't get another lockdown. We can just get on and do it. But, uh, you know, there's a... a referencing the pandemic people go out they don't particularly want to talk about the pandemic but it's strange not to mention it in passing um it can be awkward if someone starts coughing in the theater <laughs> you go, oh okay um so it, everything has changed in a way but i'm just carrying on from where i left off although i did some work over the summer and uh, festivals outdoor stuff uh, some Zoom stuff, some writing and things. I've uh, just got to go back and finish the show that I stopped doing in March um, the year before. Well, you clearly like performing because people may assume you only really became a household name, should we say maybe 10 years ago or so, maybe, because you started doing more TV. But for you, it's been a long journey, hasn't it? I mean, you've been home in your trade for many years. I'd been going, I was trying to work it out the other day. It depends when you take the stubble. It's like more like 30 years I've been going in that um, I, I haven't really done another job. I've done little jobs to get bits of money, but um, I've never tried to do anything properly. So uh, I was on the radio for a long time before I did telly and, uh, you know, I was earning a living all right. But yes, no, 2010 was kind of my breakout year in terms of um, suddenly people went, oh, that bloke you know, and recognised me and knew roughly what I did. Because uh, partially it was the branding that I, I put on stupid shirts and stuck my hair up. <laughs> and um, even if people didn't remember my name, they went, oh, the guy with the hair in the shirts. Yeah, I know, yeah, that, that guy. So it must have been maybe a bit infuriating for you because people are saying, oh, there's this new comedian on the circuit, Milton Jones, and you're there saying, well, actually, no, I've been doing it a lot longer than most of the people you see on TV now. Yes, well, it depends how you take it in terms of... It meant I had a big back catalogue of jokes that people didn't realise I had, and uh, I was going to need a lot of jokes because if you do TV, basically it burns up loads of stuff. So I was lucky in that sense. But as I say, I've always made a living. It's not as if I've had a, a difficult life in terms of uh, that career. Um, it just meant I was more, I had to triple my output for a start. And also uh, I, I was burning out stuff. What's been quite nice about the last year and a half, to be honest, apart from all the bad stuff, which has been plenty of, but it's given me a chance to have a rest because I've been charging around for 10, 11 years, uh, just doing as much as I can. Because you're also conscious that you have a, a window in that you won't necessarily be in the public eye forever. You've just got to make the most of it while you can. And that's what I've been trying to do by saying yes to virtually everything. And by the end of that, you've forgotten what you've said where. And it's good just to have a bit fallow and just think. And, you know, people say to me, oh, you must have written loads. And I have written bits and pieces. But actually, it's been quite nice to stop and to do some other things and to read and to watch Netflix and to uh, go for runs and stuff and just go, OK, and now I've got a bit of energy and I've renewed my appetite for the whole thing. Does it become easier being a performer over the years? Does it become a lot less frightening going on stage? Because for me, as a person who's never done stand-up comedy and nobody would want to hear me do stand-up comedy, I imagine that it's terrifying because you go out there, you've been preparing this content for what could be, you know, months, maybe even years. You think it's great, you go out, and it must be in the back of your mind. What if nobody laughs? Mm. Well, it's, it's sort of... Uh occupational hazard in the sense that it doesn't matter how big you are, how long you've been going, uh, 
eventually you're going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And you've mentally, you've got to come to terms with that. You just kind of hope it's nothing too public. You know, I mean, usually for me, the difficult shows are corporate events where just before I wander on the stage, someone whispered a couple of years ago, you know, they don't speak English. Yeah. I said, like, oh, this is just the <laughs> wrong time, wrong place. And you've got to accept that. Having said that, um, I think because we do it so often, we go on stage so often, that normal fear gradually is like banging your hand against a brick wall. Eventually, your hand becomes numb. And so if you keep on doing stand-up, keep on doing it, I think your body just goes, oh, I can't be bothered to be nervous anymore. And you're able to just, just get on and, and do it. And, you know, even if it doesn't go so well, you've got another show tomorrow and you don't have to sit and think about it forever and ever. But generally speaking, if people know who you are, they have a better expectation and therefore are more ready to laugh and also know where you're coming from. You know, you don't have to spend five minutes winning them over. You're, you're straight in usually. So from that point of view, it does get easier. And do you watch any of these new and upcoming comics and you think, actually, they've got it? Do you immediately know that, actually, maybe if we just tweak their jokes a little bit, they could be a massive star? Is it obvious that they've either got it or they haven't? Uh, with some people, yes. Um, they've clearly worked out who they are on stage. And, they, you know, I remember when I first saw Michael McIntyre, for instance, he was almost the complete package to begin with. His persona off stage wasn't that much different to on stage, and he was clearly working hard. Having said that, um, the cliche about stand-up comedy is it's like learning a musical instrument, except you do all your practice in public. And that's the hard thing, failing in public. And there are a lot of funny people who give up, either because they have other options or emotionally it's hard to take failing in public. Um, and conversely, strangely, there are a number of people who weren't so funny to begin with, but they just kept going and eventually they turn a corner. So it's as much to do with persistence to begin with as it is to having talent. Um, and I think also things have changed. I think uh, stand-ups when they start today are, have seen more. Do you remember in the old days it used to be called alternative comedy? Mm. Now it's just comedy. And so it's less of a niche thing. It's what we're used to seeing on a Saturday night, whether it be John Bishop or Michael McIntyre. You know, that's they've seen a lot of that, and therefore they know roughly how to use a microphone. The downside of that is that quite often they're a bit like someone you've seen before. Mm. And so there's less originality, I would say, or less clear and distinct voices uh, that you think, wow, that's new. So... Uh, and also, you can study it at university now. It is, of course, um, part of um, drama or English literature. I think, is it Falmouth and... It uh, um, should be Falmouth, but... Um, <laughs> and, and Southampton, I think, do a course, and Kent as well, um, which are quite practical. And, you know, if you follow it and take their advice, you could end up as a stand-up. But there is a danger with that, obviously, that you're creating a formula to become a stand-up comedian, which means that people will be similar. And because there's so many, you know, people have heard a lot of voices um, in the country. So it's harder to be original, I would say. Um, but it's, it's more seen as a job you can do. In the old days when I started, it was seen as a stepping stone to doing something else. You know, it's, that's how I, I started off as an actor thinking, well, if I do stand up, at least a director or a producer can come and see me and they can cast me in their show. But actually now stand up is a job in itself and you can travel, uh, well, travel the world actually, but um, you can make a living going from place to place. I mean, we've yet to see post COVID how that has affected theatres and clubs. Because I think a lot of them, you know, to do with furlough and uh, stuff, we'll see how many open again. So I think in the meantime, everyone has a podcast. <laughs> and that's the thing that's growing yeah. at the moment. Although it's really hard to get something that's original for that. 
And with you, your comedy is, it's based around wordplay, isn't it? Very sort of short one-liners. Now, would you say that it's more difficult doing your sort of jokes because literally you say them, then they've gone, as opposed to something like observational comedy where you can tell a story almost? Sure. I think it swings and roundabouts in that when I do short bits on TV, I can get straight to the jokes straight away because they're short and 10 seconds in, I've got a punchline. If you tell stories and anecdotes and it's harder to get the crowd warmed up. Ideal if you're doing an hour, two hour show in the theater because people are there and they're going to listen. So when I go out on tour, I've got 200 to 250 jokes in any one show, which all take a lot of writing. And also you don't want more than about 15 minutes of jokes in a row. Otherwise, you can see blood coming out of people's ears (laughs) because it's too much information. So uh, I have to vary it up with music and props and whatever just to make it a bit different. So, But when I go on TV or whatever, I can get to the jokes quickly. So that's what's actually made me more successful in the short term. And who are the comedians that Milton Jones looks up to and think, oh, if only I could be as funny as them? I mean, you're a hugely funny man anyway, but who are the people that you admire in comedy? Um, I mean, it's sort of slightly changed in that, obviously, before I was doing it, um, there wasn't the same kind of comedy circuit. And so I was looking up to people like Rowan Atkinson in Blackadder or Harry Enfield in... Um, doing loads of money or whatever it was. They were doing like characters rather than being comedians. The old school comedian of telling Irish jokes or mother-in-law jokes, that, was, that wasn't of interest to me. I you know, didn't want to be like that. But then in terms of who I come out of the dressing room to watch, um, I tend to like the people like Al Murray or Harry Hill or Johnny Vegas or Ross Noble where you're not quite sure what's going to happen. Mm. In fact, Sean Block was a bit like that, in that, um, you know, you see someone's set of jokes, but you know they go off at a tangent, and it could be death or glory. (laughs) (laughs) Those are the interesting people to watch, because uh, it's different every time. And... Um, yeah, a lot of that. Also, the other thing is that some, you, when you know the people concerned, sometimes you get on with a person privately and their act is okay. And the other way around as well, sometimes you think they're a brilliant act, but they're quite difficult as a person. And so you're, you end up watching your friends more because you're, you know, you socialize and you, you want to be able to talk to them afterwards. So Yeah, and also I watch who else is on before me because I need to know what they've done, really, in case I cover the same subject or um, just to I know what's going down well with an audience. Another interesting thing is that young people today, at the risk of sounding 110, um, haven't grown up with the same stuff we grew up with. They've grown up with Friends, the sitcom, a lot of American sitcoms, actually, which makes English wordplay slightly harder to tune in for them. Or they haven't heard it in the same way. And I find with a younger crowd, I have to go a bit more slowly. (laughs) I can still suck them in, but it's maybe slightly harder work uh, just so that they understand where I'm coming from in the first place. So it'd be interesting to see how that progresses because um, there isn't actually that much English wordplay on TV anymore. Well, Milton, we've really missed live shows as a whole, but we've missed seeing you. And if there's one thing we need during these tricky times, these weird times, is people like you who can make us laugh. So how can we come and see you? Where are you performing? You must be, as you said, you're so eager to perform. I bet you're everywhere, aren't you? Well, sort of. Um, I, my website, miltonjones.com, has a list of all my live dates, basically. Um, and... I'm picking up on the tour I started, which is called Milton Impossible. It's spy based. It's um, (laughs) got a lot. It's got me being interrogated in a swivel chair chase and 
pictures and music and uh, a support act and I'm all over the place till the end of next May um, so that is the best place to go well clearly hitting the ground running there Milton it's been a joy and a pleasure and the best of luck with all these performances thank you